church. Thank you, Foster, for the scripture reading. And thank you especially for walking an extra mile through not one parable, but two parables of the scripture, which we just, we just want to hear more, right, from Jesus. And it offers us really good context of our scripture today. Yeah, the parable of the Pharisee and tax collector. So let us pray. God, may the word of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It's been quite a few months since I last stood in this pulpit to preach in front of a physically gathered congregation. And it happens to be the period of time when I was physically distant from my family in China. So I thank God for my reunion with my wife, Esther, and my daughter, Peggy, last month. I thank God for the reopening of our church building. And I thank God for the positive transitions my family and our church family are celebrating after missing each other's physical presence for so long. Yet these have not included all the transitions my family and I are going through. We have just moved, as you know, from High Park to Deerfield for the next step of my academic journey. But we hope our spiritual bound with you, our High Park Union Church family, will not fade away due to this physical distance. From the beginning of our hybrid worship services in June, to our special prayers for this land and our outdoor social hour on July the 4th, I have witnessed once and once again how my beloved folks in this church community have stood side by side with one another. Amen. I always remember the joys and concerns we've shared in this faith journey that we are in together, which have kept our constantly bended spirits unbroken through our online worship services during the quarantine. And we're still doing our Zoom sanctuary right now in front of all of us. I always remember the sense of community that you all have shown me in here, where people often divided by their social status, their racial identities, and even national cultures could come together in actions for the common good, for the dignity of all beings, and for the sacredness of God endowed upon all of us with our shared vulnerability of being human. Amen. Amen. Now, all these thoughts and emotions have led me into today's scripture, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. It is probably one of the most well-known sayings of Jesus in the Bible, but also it might be one of the most misunderstood and misused parable of Jesus as well. For many Christians over the centuries, the Pharisee, the one who would be seen as justified and respected in his time, is a negative figure filled with self-righteousness and hypocrisy. Sounds familiar? On the other hand, the tax collector, the sinful collaborator against his own people, becomes a hero of repentance and even of Christian faith. And this interpretation is often linked to the famous parable of the prodigal son. Also, in the Gospel of Luke, the Pharisee in the temple, like the elderly brother in the field, is understood as engaging in works righteousness and refusing to accept the repentant sinner. 
while the prodigal son and the tax collector are both regarded as saved by grace, justified and loved by God. What's even worse, the Pharisee and even the Jewish temple in the parable were historically associated with the so-called unrepentant, self-righteous Judaism, while the tax collector was recognized as a prototype of the redeemed Gentile Christianity by church leaders like Augustine and Martin Luther. As the Jewish exegete, Amy Jill Levine points out, quote, such wills of the temple, Pharisees and Judaism rely on negative stereotypes and not on what the parable says of what the sources of the period indicate. Such stereotypes also overlook the form of Jesus' storytelling. Neither the Pharisee nor the tax collector behaves in the manner that a first century Jewish audience would expect. Listeners of Jesus' parable would be surprised that the Pharisee would be dismissive of others in the community. They would be surprised that a tax collector can be repentant and they would be provoked as we all should be by the implications of the relationship between the two people, end quote. So what does this parable really say? To answer this question, we need to first understand what it doesn't say. To begin with, it is not meant to condemn the Pharisees among Jesus' Jewish audience. In Luke 18, 9, the setting of this parable is given. Jesus was addressing some who trusted in themselves, but they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Although personal trust and recognition are not necessarily bad things, negative judgment and contempt toward others in the community are undoubtedly problematic. Indeed, the Pharisee in the parable did despise other people, thieves, rocks, adulterers, and the tax collector in his prayer to God. However, from the preceding narrative in chapters 17 through 18, we know that Jesus' audience includes both his disciples and a group of Pharisees. So those regarding others with contempt do not necessarily refer to the Pharisees. It may well refer to Jesus' own disciples, last mentioned in 1722. Through this arrangement, Luke shows us that negatively judging others is not a trait that signals Jewish or Pharisaic values. It is rather a shared human trait, a human, human vulnerability, and one to which the followers of Jesus may also fall into. Moreover, this parable is not meant to critique the Jewish temple either. In Luke 18, 10, Jesus opened up the drama with the Pharisee and tax collector going up the temple to pray together. Just like we assemble in the sanctuary for worship, for revival, and for spiritual companionship, the both people in this parable, for them, the temple was a house of communal prayer. It was a place where God could be found, where faith could be celebrated, where covenant could be proclaimed. It was a place where their Jewish identity could be manifested before the repressive power of Roman politics. It was also the same place where Jesus' followers continued to worship together after his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. Now we might ask to follow up questions. Who were the Pharisees on earth? Who were the caste collectors? Far from his modern usage about self-righteousness or hypocrisy, the term Pharisee actually refers to a marker of distinction. Yes, that's what Pharisee or Pharisaic means, which is also reflected in Paul's personal recognition of religious piety in Philippians 3, 5. The Pharisees were students of the Torah, the law of God, and they strive to walk blamelessly in his moral teachings. They were devout Jews in their local communities, but they were not religious elites 
like Sadducees in the temple, or monastics like the Essenes in the wilderness. They were respected among Jewish folks for their devotions to tithing, fasting, and observing the Sabbath, but they were not necessarily rich. In contrast, tax collectors were a group of people who gained their wealth through exploitation. They were traitors against their own people who sold them out to their Roman oppressors. Although they were indeed labeled as sinners in the synagogues at that time, tax collectors were by no means oppressed by other Jews, but actually their oppressors who had likely shown no mercy to others. Although we have a few examples of repentant tax collectors like Zacchaeus in Luke 19, Jesus' Jewish audience would not expect tax collectors at large to change their immoral lifestyle or even pray to God for mercy in the temple. Therefore, Jesus' disciples and other Jews in the crowd must have been very surprised by his storytelling. They were only to be more surprised as it proceeds. In verses 11 to 12, it was said that Pharisee stood by himself and prayed. It might be the case that he simply wanted to focus for attention on God and not disturb others. But somehow this distance from the rest of the community betrayed his sense of elitism, which to be honest, was pretty common among devout Jews from the Dead Sea Scrolls to rabbinic Judaism. And the use of I language is not necessarily the problem either. We might even compare Jesus' own prayer in Matthew eleven twenty five, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Then with the open expression of praise and a sincere acknowledgement of God's authority, the Pharisee addressed God directly in his prayer of thanksgiving and vindication. It shows his sincere act gratitude for God's power and grace to do good and avoid evil as it is suggested in some well-known Psalms, like Psalm 23, read last Sunday. It also says in Psalm 1 as follows, happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path a sinner's tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the Torah of the Lord and on their Torah, they meditate day and night. Therefore, this prayer is not really a dramatic show of piety or self-justifying monologue as most traditional exegetes suggest. As Amy Jo Levine nicely portrays, quote, what is really astonishing about the prayer is not the list of good acts. It is astonishing because it negatively judged the tax collector rather than attempts to bring him into a better religious purview as his fellow community member, end quote. In other words, Jesus was calling his disciples and us today into accountability for one another so that we might not yield to temptations of distancing ourselves from the other. Amen? Amen. Now, when it comes to the text collector in verse 13, the scene becomes even more surprising. His head bowing, his mercy pleading, his breast beating, all these have left strong impressions on you and me. It is rightly said by some interpreters, quote, we have met some apparently penitent tax collectors at the Jordan River with John the Baptist, and it has the household table with Jesus and Levi, the tax collector, but not in the temple and not in such a dramatic mode. And we have no reason to doubt the tax collector's sincerity. He bravely entered the temple where he knew that other worshipers might regard him as a collaborator. He admitted his sin and his need for mercy." End quote. For Jesus' Jewish audience and us today, neither the Pharisee nor the tax collector in this parable is too extreme an example to be identified with. Like the Jewish people in Jesus' time, we are also struggling with different voices about sin and grace, about justice and mercy 
in various traditions of the Bible and the faith community. We are also facing different challenges with all kinds of power dynamics and making all kinds of decisions about covenantal faithfulness in our lives. We may live in privileged situations where it is quite, not quite burdensome for us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God as the scriptures have taught us. We may otherwise live in disadvantaged situations where repressive power dynamics like systemic injustice constantly force us into difficult choices between God and money, between piety and survival. However, as fellow members of a praying community, we are not called to stand by ourselves in pride or to stand far off in shame, but to stand along with the other in our shared sanctuary, in the congregational prayer of God's people. Amen. But now you might ask, if the Pharisee is not a negative figure in the parable, then how about verse 14? Does it not say that this man, the tax collector, went down to his home justified rather than the other, the Pharisee? Well, like many other English translations of the New Testament, NRSV treats this Greek prepositional construction as a contrast, meaning rather than or against. But a more common sense of the term in Greek New Testament is actually connective, meaning next to or along with. Therefore, my translation of verse 14 goes as follows. I say to you, this man went down to his home, justified along with the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. In other words, Jesus might have suggested that both were justified. Both became in the right with God because of God's grace through the gathering of their community. Both of them came before God among God's people with their merits or issues. Both of them faced the temptations of isolating themselves and struggled with a sense of individualism. However, willingly or reluctantly, both of them share the space of worship, the space of revival, and the space of spiritual companionship with one another, which made their reconnection or even reconciliation in the future possible. As a community with people from various economic, ethical, and racial backgrounds, God's people today are likewise called by Jesus to stand side by side in our prayers, to walk side by side in our faith journey, and to become right with God side by side in our shared joys and concerns. Amen? Amen. From this parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, we have learned that the praying community to which we commit ourselves helps us to build us up in a sheer sense of belonging and accountability. It relieves our sense of isolation caused by either pride or guilt or simply social distancing practices to protect one another during the COVID-19 pandemic. But there are a few questions we need to constantly ask ourselves through this text. Will we accept the tax collectors among God's people rather than look down upon them with disgust? Will we go along with them in solidarity from God's house to our homes? And in light of Christianity's non-Jewish dominance and anti-Jewish strains over the centuries, where we Christians today welcome Jews around God's table and strive not to justify ourselves by regarding Jews, ancient or modern, with contempt. I'd like to conclude this sermon with the final remarks of the Jewish exegete, Amy Jill Levine. Quote, we are all our brothers and sisters keeper, and living in a community is another form of group work. 
We all have something to contribute, even if what we give is just the opportunity for someone else to provide us a benefit. If we take more seriously this necessary interrelationship, we might be more inclined to consider others because our actions, whether for you or for good, will impact them. And if our good deeds aid someone else rather than begrudge them, why not celebrate all who are justified? End quote. Yes, like the Pharisee and the tax collector, we have become in the right with God through our shared space of worship and prayer along with one another. But unlike the Pharisee and the tax collector, may we count our privileges carry each other's burdens, and celebrate all who are justified in God's eyes. Thanks be to God. Amen.